2,000 years ago, ancestors of the Shoshone arrive on the coast of what will become Southern California. Attracted by the temperate climate, they settle in the canyons. They name the area Lagunas, after two freshwater lagoons nearby. By the time it is renamed Laguna Beach in 1904, the area is already a popular seaside resort. By the 20s, almost half the residents there are artists. It started off as a colony for uh, uh, artists and writers, and uh, so there's still a lot of that kind of uh, uh, flavor to the culture of the town. Somebody described it as a, a place that not only uh, tolerates diversity, it uh, positively revels in it. <laughs> uh, basically, I came to California to skateboard about nine years ago to turn professional. It's a beautiful area. The lagoon is so beautiful, it's so inspiring. It was just so much more natural. Uh, the environment, it was so crisp and clear. And you felt as if you were just slightly isolated from everything else. The homes along Laguna Canyon Road near Big Bend are typical of the houses that sprout up the hillsides of the canyon, terraced one on top of the other. When Paul Wright and Birgitta Marshall are looking for a home in Laguna Beach, fellow Brit Glenn Fluke and his fiance Jennifer Seagraves help them find one just above theirs, complete with its own backyard waterfall. Just down Laguna Canyon Road is the home of airline pilot Charlie Quilter and his wife Anne. Laguna Beach is Charlie's hometown, and he's seen it at its best and its worst. In 1993, a terrible fire devastates the canyon. Then in December of 1997, the city is flooded when torrential rains overflow the banks of Laguna Canyon Creek. Monday, February 23rd, 1998. After a Sunday of heavy showers, morning skies are gray, but the rain at least has slowed to a drizzle. Both Glenn and I woke up in the morning and we went outside and the, uh, the water was running down the hillside brown. So it was always clear, but that morning it was brown. I mean, so in a way, you kind of, you, you was given an idea that something wasn't quite right from the very get go that day. Jennifer Seagraves and Glenn Fluke are supposed to have dinner with her parents that evening. They drop in on Paul Wright and Birgitta Marshall, who are leaving for England the following morning. So I was actually wrapping all my gifts for everyone, sitting on the floor, listening to the rain and listening to the waterfall getting heavier and heavier and heavier over the course of the day. And then in the evening, it just got heavier and heavier. As the waterfall was heavier and stronger and was more intense and the sound was so much louder, it just, it was actually quite deafening. We still never thought anything about it. Glenn and Jennifer return home to check for water. Higher on the hill, Charlie and Ann Quilter are on their way to pick up their daughter in the city. They drive down towards Big Bend, just a few hundred yards from the house. We got stopped there by at first, I thought it was just a, uh, a skim of, of water running across the road, which is normal. But then as I started to drive into it, I realized that it was a, kind of a, a soupy mud. You know, the tires were getting stuck uh, in the water, and we realized that this was, this was way beyond what we'd ever experienced before. This was not normal. This was something different was happening that night. At approximately 8.10, Somewhere above Laguna Canyon Road, nature has taken all that she can and simply lets go. We heard a big thundering boom, crash. And uh, what it was was the uh, thin layer of soil up on these steep cliff faces uh, letting go and then roaring down the watercourses and uh, flowing out around the houses. You could hear the slide starting at the tops of the hills and then gaining momentum and it would get louder and louder and louder and louder and it was really frightening because you didn't know where it was coming from. You could hear the boulders and the, and the, the glass breaking and the smashing and all the stuff in the kitchen. I then heard Paul shout at me and we hid next to the bed as if it, you would be safe. And that was when we could hear people from the street screaming 
get out of the house, get out of the house, the hillside's coming down. And that's when we jumped out the window. And I remember taking my first step in the mud because it sucked me in and I fell over. And Paul grabbed me by my shirt collar and actually pulled me up out of the mud. I didn't realise that it was that bad or it was that powerful. Seven homes in the Big Bend section of Laguna Canyon Road are hit by the massive landslide. Some residents are able to evacuate, clambering down the roofs of houses surrounded by swirling muck that also buries cars in the street. Jennifer Seagraves and Glenn Flute find refuge on the roof of their house. Glenn helps their friends climb aboard. I remember Jen and I is just saying to each other, I can't believe this. We can't believe this. We can't believe this is happening. Despite several 911 calls, there is no sign of help. Jennifer turns to the people she knows she can count on, her family. About 8.30 she called and she was totally hysterical. She was sitting on a roof with Glenn and mud was rushing down the front of her house. And uh, I just told her to, that Roddy and I would come up there and get them. Gary and his son Rod leave the car behind, wading through the mud toward the canyon. Pretty soon the mud was up to our waist. And this was like a very slow moving river of chocolate pudding. And we're walking against the tide, it's pushing, coming at us. When Gary and Rod Seagraves arrive, the slides have subsided. Jennifer and her friends are safe and sound, thanks largely to Glenn Fluke. We got her off the roof of their house. She was too, too terrified, she said, to climb down and jump down. He insisted, pull, drag, whatever he had to do to get her off the roof of his house. When he first helped us up onto the roof, it didn't even surprise me. It was almost as if it would be him that would do it. Glenn doesn't stop there. He goes back for a mother and three small children trapped on the roof of their home. And he went from car top to car top, leaping from car to car to get to the house to one by one bring the children to safety and then the mom to safety. Glenn actually said, we've been playing Rambo. This is great. They were just having a ball. By 9.30 p.m., everyone in the area is accounted for. Several homes are full of mud, but nobody is hurt. With no emergency vehicles in sight, a neighbor, Michael Folks, takes the rescued mother and children to his house higher up on Castle Rock Road. Ann Quilter offers her home just below it to the Seagraves and their friends. I felt very uncomfortable going to a stranger's house. We were covered with mud. But Jennifer was, had one shoe. She lost one in the mud. Glenn was barefoot. There weren't a lot of options at that point in time. While Charlie hoses cake mud off Gary and Rod Seagraves, Ann takes the others inside for hot showers and dry clothes. And there was a waterfall outside, and I thought it, what an amazing view it was to look out your kitchen and have a waterfall practically outside your kitchen door. And we can see the waterfall coming down and going underneath the house. In a way, you, you, your head's telling you, like, this is not a good idea. We actually did said, why don't we all walk out at this point? And everyone's kind of the general consensus is, now we'll wait till the morning. As midnight approaches, Anne gets everyone settled. Paul and Brigitte are in the upper part of the house in a spare bedroom. Charlie is also upstairs changing his clothes. Jennifer, Glenn, Gary, and Rod are camped out in the living room. Outside, the rain has finally subsided. On his balcony above the quilters, neighbor Michael Folks looks down in wonder at the changes that nature has made to the landscape below. As Michael turns to go inside, the hills above him let go, roaring down the canyon wall like a locomotive, his house directly in its path. But when the mass of mud and debris hits the side of the ravine, it banks away from the folks' house, leaving it intact. Instead, it plummets over a 200-foot cliff. Beneath it is the quilter home. I was standing up kind of talking about who wants what kind of pillow, who wants blankets, and where should we put everybody. 
when there was just this tremendous boom. In split second, it was everything that you didn't think would happen all over again. The mudslide lands on top of the Quilter house, turning its gentle backyard waterfall into an angry torrent that rips out the bottom two stories and plows through the living room. My daughter, having just been through a mudslide a few, a few hours earlier, knew what the noise was. She jumped on the back of the couch that I was laying on and was thrown through the window over about an eight-foot balcony. I rolled on the floor instantly, and all I remember is hearing Roddy said, Dad, your head. Gary Seagraves is trapped under the mud, his head caught between the couch and the quilter's heavy coffee table. The flow of mud knocks Anne, Rod, and Glenn off their feet and hurls them out of the living room and out the front door. I sort of felt like I was underneath a wave and I was being tossed and turned around and around, but I thought I was still in my living room. Below the quilter house, in the next lot down, is a shelter for homeless cats. Its caretaker, Carmelo Sarabia, lives close by with his wife, Teresa, and their family. The slide thunders through their home, splitting it in two, taking Carmelo and his wife with it. Teresa holds nine-month-old Tiffany in her arms, but the howling mud snatches her baby away. Upstairs at the Quilter house, Paul Wright and Birgitta Marshall are in unfamiliar territory. You have no idea how to get out of the house. You have no idea the layout of the house. You can't see your hand in front of your face, and just the room's filling up more and more and more and more with mud. It was um, cold and wet and this intense smell. The room was a uh, heavy lined window, so we couldn't smash the windows. Couldn't get out the door because the water uh, gushed against the door, so you couldn't pull the door open towards the mud because of the force of actually closing the door. The scariest thing of it all was the fact that any second now, you, you, it's, it's going to be over. In what is left of the living room, the rush of mud forces the floor to give way, freeing Gary Seagraves from the trap it set for him just minutes before. But it is not nature's plan to save him. He falls 35 feet down the waterfall to the canyon below. And the only way I could describe it, it would be like falling down stairs that were eight feet apart. I kind of accepted the idea that I was going to die. And then I started like screaming at God, don't let my kids be going through this. Back in the house, Paul and Birgitta are running out of time. I remember the bed was floating and it was pushing us against our supposed escape route through the bathroom. And Paul had his finger stuck and we were trying to pry the door open. But there was a very small gap. We had um, a very small area to climb through. As we escaped out of that room, I mean, there wasn't a lot of room between the mud and the ceiling as we went up the stair passage. It was only a matter of a couple of feet. I mean, it was filling up so fast. And that was when we bumped into, we met Charlie up, upstairs. Charlie Quilter has been trying to get through the mud to the living room below, desperately searching for his wife. Unable to save her, he leads Paul and Birgitta out of the house. When they are outside, the full impact of what has happened hits them all. My mind couldn't register what I was seeing. What I was seeing was this huge uh, waterfall coming out of the floor of the living room. And I, I realized there, there wasn't a floor left in the living room. It, 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 was, it, it was gone, along with the people in it, including the person most precious to me. I yelled for Ann, and of course, my yells, and they were swallowed up by the roar of the, uh, of the water. I realized that Ann had to be dead. Nobody could have survived this. Ann Quilter has fallen over two stories, swept away by the rushing mud. Its force throws her against one wall of the cat shelter, then buries her. I had a big two by four um, that ended up being pressed against my throat. You can't believe it's happening and you think, I, you know, I can't believe I'm gonna die like this. 
first, she must get away from the board that is slowly strangling her. With all her remaining strength, Anne is able to get an arm free, then a leg. As she crawls away from the wall of the cat shelter, Anne Quilter doesn't see Gary Seagraves lying in the mud not far away. I had no idea if I was facing up or down. I, had, I was just in mud. And there was something pressing on my face. And it was some kind of screening. And it went up you know, six, seven, eight inches as I was pushing on it. And I felt it go free. The sound of screams lead Paul Wright and Birgitta Marshall to the bottom of a hill. There is a body there buried under mud and rock. It is Jennifer Seagraves. When we started moving her, she said, where's Glenn? She shouted, where's Glenn? Where's Glenn? Unaware that his daughter has been found, Gary Seagraves begins searching for his children. He has lost his glasses and can hardly see. I very, very carefully was taking steps forward, realizing there was a lot of broken stuff in this mud. And while I was doing this, I was just screaming, Jennifer, Glenn, Rod, you know, as loud as I could scream. I took two, maybe three steps, and there was this baby laying in the mud, right on top of the mud. It looked camouflaged. And I um, reached down to touch the baby, and it whimpered. So I realized it was alive. It is nine-month-old Tiffany Sarabia. As Gary gently carries her through the mud, he finds something in her that gives him hope for his own children. There was something comforting about this baby. And I'm kind of an out-of-shape, middle-aged guy. This baby is a very fragile thing, so if we survive, they should survive. And then I saw three figures coming at me in the dark. And two of them was Paul and Jennifer's friends, Paul and Brigida. And they were with Jennifer, and she was covered from head to toe with mud. It is approximately 12.34 a.m. The first fire engine arrives at the scene to take control of rescue operations. While there is still no sign of Glenn Fluke, Rod Seagraves is found trapped inside the cat shelter, his leg broken and tangled in chicken wire above the floor. Firemen are able to free him, and he's loaded into an ambulance with his sister, Jennifer. Birgitta Marshall finds Ann Quilter shivering in the cold and helps her find warmth in one of the fire trucks. Charlie Quilter is told that his wife is alive. He came around to the front of the fire truck and looked up and banged on the window and um, he wasn't gonna be satisfied till he could personally see that I was okay. She was stark naked, covered head to toe in mud, uh, obviously um, uh, bleeding uh, around her, her face and, uh, and uh, a few other places. And, um, but she was, she was obviously alive and, and uh, apparently okay because she snarled at me, close the door, I'm freezing. Twenty houses are damaged in the Big Bend area of Laguna Canyon Road, while neighboring homes 20 feet away remain untouched. Whole rooms are gone while others still stand. That morning, rescue workers discover a sock-covered foot sticking up from under a beat-up house trailer. It is attached to the mud-covered body of a young man. All that identifies him is a muddy silver necklace around his neck. When she is told about the necklace, Jennifer Seagraves confirms that it belongs to her fiancé, Glenn Fluke. The guy who owned the trailer said when they found his body, he was a very peaceful look on his face, a lot like he, so we assume he was probably knocked unconscious when he went under there. He wasn't like he was struggling to get out. To me, a hero is someone who puts themselves in jeopardy to say, to help other people, and he did that. He risked his life. By the end of the day, the death toll has risen to four. Eleven are critically injured. For Rod Seagraves, the road to recovery involves surgery and physical pain. For his sister Jennifer and her friends, the healing process is one of the heart, but no less painful. We don't see each other, I think, as much as we'd like. I'd love to see more of Jen. She's working really hard. She's uh, trying very hard to pick up the pieces. Both of us were, were, were aware, when it's your time, 
it's your time. And Glenn was aware of that concept. He was taken away for a, for a bigger, better thing. I just don't understand what, you know? It is ironic that out of the people in my house, one man died, but because I did have the other people in my house, a little baby lived. That baby would not have lived had Gary Seagraves not been in my living room because they never would have found that baby. The natural world is one of cycles. The seasons change one to another. The sun rises and sets, then rises again. There is continuity in nature, a harmony that soothes us with its familiar rhythm. Yet some of us have experienced nature's dark side, the discord of her rage, her random acts of cruelty, her power to destroy not only the landscape, but the lives we once knew. Every day you turn the news on, you pick up a newspaper, turn the TV on, and there's something happening to somebody. It's always someone else. I mean, the odds are it's not going to happen to me. Well, back in February, I was the guy on the front page of the paper, and it happened to me. As Gary Seagraves has learned, disaster can happen to anyone. Certainly, the course of a life is guided by the choices made, but fate is also influenced by chance by good luck and bad. Like the weather, life is unpredictable and not always easy to forecast. It's just God who decides who's going to stay and who's going to die. You know, you can be in the same danger at the same time, and whoever's going to be saved, it's just a matter of faith. The things you can't change in life, you have to accept, and you just go on. There's no way to be prepared for something like this, I mean, an experience like this, and I, and, uh, I think everyone was going to deal with it a little differently. I think that each person has to look within themselves to come up with what they're going to learn from it and how they're going to cope with it. You must keep on going. If you're given a second chance, you must keep on going. The beaches of Acapulco are alive again with tourists. The residents along Laguna Canyon Road have begun the task of rebuilding. Ships come and go in Kobe Harbor. Life goes on. But for those who have faced nature's rage, there is new respect, a new reverence, and a new way of seeing the world. I think more than anything, it's made me value um, relationships and friendships. It's like being born again. It's like, uh, it's like getting another life. If you survive something like this, you, you, you bring a whole new perspective to your life. And you realize that a lot of stuff is not uh, very important. I now realize there are many things I have no control over. So I don't put a lot of energy anymore into things that I can't control. What I want out of life is being with my family and being with my friends. Because I know that's all you can take with you. When your time comes, that's all that's really important is who you've been and what you've been able to accomplish in the life that you've been given. And when you get a second chance to do it again, life is very precious.